This is part two of my video on buying a MIG welder for light industrial or DIY use. In part one I covered the series of factors that I think you should consider when you're buying your first MIG welder. Here in part two I will give you a rundown on the welder that I bought. Once again my focus will be on the Australian situation but some of what I say will be relevant to other countries. Welcome to another video on the White Dog Garage YouTube channel. My name is Bob. The criteria I used to select my MIG was price of course, that's always important, that it would run on the standard Australian 230 volt domestic electricity supply that it had at least 180 amps of output that it would run either gas and of course as a consequence gasless and that I would have access to a good supply of consumables and support for the machine. I ended up buying the Renegade Industrial 200 amp MIG machine. Renegade Industrial is a house brand of a company called Trade Tools. It's a local company and their nearest shop is just a short drive down the road from where I am based. It has the maximum input current of 32 amps and an effective current of 14 amps. So we're talking a 15 amp plug and we're talking a 32 amp or better circuit breaker. For mega 200 amps the duty cycle is 20% and the 100% duty cycle is at uh, 90 amps essentially. Price is good. I already have uh, two other Renegade industrial machines, one of which I've had for 20 years. They've performed faultlessly during the time that I've had them, so I've got no problem with buying that brand again. And I'll make the usual proviso here. Trade Tools has not paid uh, any contribution towards this uh, video. The new MIG will join the other three welders that I already have in the shop. A 55 year old 130 amp AC transformer machine which will go on for years yet. The only thing I've ever done with this old lady is replace the bolt terminals with DIN style ones so all my leads are interchangeable from welder to welder. Above it is a 200 amp AC DC TIG inverter unit. This is a Renegade industrial one. It's about 13 to 14 years old. I use it mainly for aluminium and on occasion stainless steel. My second Renegade industrial machine is a 200 amp DC inverter welder. I've had this one for a good 20 years and during that time it has been my main workhorse doing endless amounts of stick welding. It's never given any trouble. All these welders come fitted with 15 amp plugs and draw their power from dedicated 32 amp circuits. What comes in the box apart from the packing? The MIG welder of course. A V roller and a U roller, both with double tracks for 0.8 and 0.9 millimeter or 30 or 35 thou wire. A length of gas hose two spare contact tips, a spare Teflon polyethylene liner for aluminium work, work and earth leads, and an MB15 benzyl style torch with a Euro type connection. The welder comes fitted with a 15 amp plug and a manual is also included. Of course, you will need a few more things before you can start welding. I also bought a Unimig starter kit, mainly because it was better value than buying the extra tips and nozzles that I wanted individually. This one suits the MB15 Binzel style torch that comes with the welder. If you had a different torch, say an MB24, you would need a different box of bits. In the box is a pair of MIG pliers, 10 0.8 and 10.9 millimeter contact tips, two spare nozzles, two tip holders, two nozzle springs, and I've also tucked in there the two spare contact tips that came with the welder, 
and a T-piece and hose clamps that I'll be using to plumb in the welder into my gas supply. I've also bought a kilogram roll of 0.8mm MIG welding wire, 4.5 kilogram rolls of 0.9mm MIG welding wire and gasless flux core welding wire. A spray can of anti-spatter and a can of nozzle dip. For aluminium welding, I bought a 10 pack of 0.9 mm contact tips. And a 0.45 kilogram roll of 0.9 mm aluminium MIG welding wire. Here is a full list of the consumables that I bought. Now I bought a full range of consumables because I want to use the machine to its full potential. But it's your choice as to what you buy. My only hint being, get spare contact tips in the wire size and type that you intend to use the MIG for. This MIG comes with the leads needed to stick weld, and that option is what I'm showing here first. There are suitably marked DINs outlets, into which I inserted the earth and work plugs. There is a switch to the side of the knobs on the control panel, where the MMA setting, which stands for Manual Metal Arc, is selected for stick welding. The labels on the two knobs indicate that the left hand one controls wire feed and the right hand one controls current. For a MEG, those labels are confusing and I'll talk more about that shortly. For this stick welding exercise, I'm going to run a 4mm electrode and I set the knob about halfway between the 140 and 200 amp marks. The specified range for MMA is 20 to 160 amps and I'm estimating that I've got about 140 or 145 amps flowing into the rod. Nothing fancy here, just a bead on a piece of scrap steel. can certainly do the job as a stick welder if that versatility is needed. To swap over to the MIG function, I start by removing the work lead, but the earth lead, which is still needed, is left in place. Then I connected the MIG torch lead. It has a Euro fitting that must be orientated in the correct way, after which the collar is screwed up tight. Next I move the switch on the control panel from the MMA setting to the MIG setting. Then it is on to fitting some wire. I'm starting with the 0.9mm or 35 thou flux core. The feed roller width has to match this size. I'm using the V roller which works for both flux core and bare steel wire. The roller supplied with this machine has two grooves, 0.9mm on one side 0.8mm or 30 thou on the other side. The one to use, in this case the 0.9mm one, goes to the inside of the wire feed drive. This machine will take rolls of wire up to 5 kilograms in size and spacers are used to position the bigger diameter hub of the 5 kilogram roll.
The spindle nut is tightened, but not too tight as the roll needs to be able to turn freely. The wire can unravel very easily. For storage you just turn back through a convenient hole in the side of the roll to prevent this. Taking it out, I've clipped the bent piece off with the MIG pliers. You need to get used to cutting off bits of MIG wire for all sorts of reasons. Yes, it's wasteful, but bent wire cannot be straightened enough so it will not snag in the torch lead. The next trick is to thread the wire through the drive unit. You cannot see the hole you are pushing the wire into, but with practice you'll strike it easily enough. The wire goes over the roller and then the tensioner is folded down into place and the tensioner adjustment knob nipped up. The tensioner cannot be too tight for flux cool, it will end up crushing the wire. There are two ways of feeding the wire through to the torch end. A button inside the case is the fastest way. But you can also turn the wire feed knob on the control panel to maximum and pull the trigger on the torch as well. Next thing to do is to make sure the polarity is correct. There are two leads with wing nuts inside the case and for gasless the black lead goes to the plus or positive terminal. The torch represents the electrode in this situation and for gasless or flux core the setting is electrode that is the torch negative and for solid wire it is electrode positive. Finally some fine tuning of the wire tension needs to be done. The tension can't be too tight on gasless wire. I like to get it tight enough so at the torch end I can just slow the feed right down with my fingers just enough before the drive starts to slip. Closing the flap on the machine, I'm almost ready to weld. The two knobs on the control panel are labelled wire feed and amps, but having switched to the MIG setting, the amps knob becomes the voltage control, but there are no units shown. Specifications for this welder show the MIG voltage adjustable from 16.5 to 24 volts and I'm setting the knob about halfway which should be about 20 volts which is a good place to start. The wire feed dial ranges from 0.5 to 13. I can find no reference to what those units are and I wonder if they are meters per minute. So for the moment I am positioning the wire feed at the halfway point. At these settings I'm ready to try a weld and just as in demonstrating performance I am just welding on a piece of scrap metal. In this case a rusty steel offcut about 10 millimeters thick and I've not even cleaned the surface rust off. This is flux coil so the torch is angled to the travel direction or as the saying goes if there is slag you drag. The well bead is okay for a first pass, maybe a little high, dialing back the bolts might fix that. The second flux core test is a piece of 0.9 or 1 millimeter thick steel. I've left the voltage setting the same but have turned down the wire feed which equates to less amps for the thinner material. As a first pass, I'm happy enough that it will do flux core welding well. The downside of flux core is a smoke and spatter and that's why I personally prefer to have bare wire mix. The manual gives some guidance on weld settings but I find it confusing so I'm going to take a minute to air my misgivings with it. Page 8 on selecting wire size, feed and voltage is okay but I find page 9 confusing. For MIG welding, the critical parameters for the weld size and penetration of voltage and wire feed, but the manual talks relentlessly about amperage for MIG welding. Amperage or current in MIG welding is a function of wire feed. The faster the wire feed, the more current that flows. If you think of it this way, current is the passage of electrons between two contacts. The more electrons, the more current. If we say a millimetre or one sixteenth of an inch of weld wire has a million electrons, for example, 
The more millimetres or sixteenths of an inch that you feed into the weld puddle, the greater the number of electrons crossing into the material being welded, and thus the greater current flow or amperage. But depending on the thickness of the material being welded, increasing voltage also has a part to play, controlling both the height and width of the weld. The table for lap welding on page 9 shows welding speed in centimetres per minute, and then the table below for fillet welding in the vertical position shows wire speed in centimetres per minute. Welding speed would be, to me, the speed at which the torch moves across the work, and if that is the meaning here, the values listed in the top table are credible. However, wire speed is the feed rate for the machine, and that does not gel with the knob, which has a range of 0.5 to 13, for which the units might be metres per minute. In the bottom table, looking at the value listed for the 3.2 millimetre section width, the recommended wire speed is 45 to 55 centimetres per minute, which would be 0.5 to 0.55 metres per minute. But on the previous page, a setting of 5 metres or 500 centimetres per minute is being proposed for 1 millimetre wire, which is more realistic than the proposed values in the second table. As I said, I find the manual confusing in that bottom table. However, it's always a good idea to do a practice weld to get your settings right. And I would suggest with this machine, you start as I do with both the wire feed and the amperage come voltage knobs set midway, run your test weld and adjust up or down from there. Swapping out the flux core, I wind the wire back through the torch hose back into the reel and then to prevent it unravelling, bend the wire and insert it through a hole in the reel rim. Cut the burnt end off the wire before rolling it back. Then it's just a matter of unscrewing the nut on the roller shaft and removing the roll. The next demonstration is welding for gas and for this I'm using 0.9mm or 35 thou steel wire. The biggest roll that this machine will take in the cabinet is 5 kilograms or about 11 pounds, maybe 10 pounds in the US. Wire also comes in 0.45 kilogram one kilogram and 15 kilogram rolls. I've always worked with the bigger one which will be the 15 kilogram roll and I was reaching for this one in the shop when I realized the cabinet was not big enough to hold it. Realistically however five kilogram rolls are fine for my sort of work but I think you could if you wanted set up an external hub outside the case to run 15 kilogram rolls drilling a hole in the back to allow the wire to pass through to the wire feeder. I certainly have used MIG machines in the past that have had the roll sitting on a hub external to the machine. Uh, probably not work safe these days however. In an identical fashion to flux core, the wire roll is mounted on the hub skewered with the nut. Again, the wire is fed into the drive mechanism. Same roller is used, the tensioner is brought down and the wire wound through to the torch end and the stick out trimmed. Recalling that for solid wire the torch has to be electrode positive, the black and red leads are changed over from the flux core setting so that the red lead is now on the plus or positive terminal and the black on the minus or negative terminal. Most welders have various labels as to what goes where and this unit certainly has a descriptive sequence inside the lift flap on the side of the machine. Finally I've connected a hose from my argon bottle to the inlet port on the back of the welder and set the gas flow at about 18 litres per minute. Again I'm starting with the voltage and wire feed knobs set to about midway in their ranges. First I'm doing a weld on a thick piece of scrap steel this time there is no slag and the torch is pushed along, not dragged.
Happy with that, I turn the feed rate back a bit and do a test weld on the thin scrap. More expensive machines come with weld timers, which are for the user to do what are called stitch welding and spot welding. This is a nice feature, but not essential. The user can do, just as I'm showing here, uh, just using trig control. It's as easy as that. Short, short bursts and it's done. My final demonstration will be aluminium welding. I start by removing the nozzle. This is where the MIG pliers come into their own. They have grips everywhere for all the components on the torch. With the nozzle off, the tip we have been using is removed and a 0.9mm aluminium tip is fitted and the nozzle refitted. The tip is still copper but it's a slightly bigger bore to allow easier passage of the aluminium wire. This unit comes with a spare Teflon polyethylene liner which is to be preferred for aluminium work and which I will fit now. You can use the original liner for all wires but run the rest that the soft aluminium wire will snag and jam. The Euro connector is undone at the machine. This allows access to the liner which is held in place by a 10mm nut securing a collet on the end of the liner. The nut is undone, the torch hose is laid out flat and the liner is pulled back from the hose. The standard liner has a metal spring end which is where you could snag the aluminium welding wire. And this is the main reason why a Teflon polyethylene liner is to be preferred for such work. I removed the Teflon polyethylene liner from its package, noting that a new collet is included with it, but the new liner needs to be trimmed to size first. To do this, I feed the liner into the torch hose until it reaches the end, that is, no more liner can be fed in. Then I slide the collet into place and I use a marker pen to put a mark at the top of the collet. I then pull the liner slightly out, slide the collet forward along the liner and cut the liner on the torch side, just a bit before the mark that I made with the pen. When tightened up the collet will move forward on the liner and this is why it needs to be cut a little short. Throw away the cut off piece of liner as it's of no use. With a collet in place and the liner fully inserted up against the torch top, I screw on the nut. With the Teflon polyethylene liner clamped in place, I refit the lead to the MIG, making sure I properly aligned the Euro connector.
I'm using a 0.5 kilogram aluminium roll for this test. It has a smaller bore and it is slid directly over the hub shaft without the insert used for the bigger rolls. So as not to lose it, I slide the insert onto the shaft as well, using it as a sort of washer with the nut holding the smaller reel in place. You could also store the insert inside the MIG box. A different roller is used for the softer aluminium wire. I'm using the 0.8, 0.9mm one with the U groove that came with the machine. The wire size I'm using is 0.9mm or 35 thou. And once again, the roller is fitted with the 0.9mm groove on the inside. As before, a small length of aluminium wire is unwound from the wheel, trimmed and then inserted into the drive mechanism. Once a wire is past the roller, the tensioner is locked down and the wire feed button pressed until the wire emerges from the torch end. Wire tension is even more critical with aluminium. This time I'm adjusting the tension until I reach a stage where finger pressure bends or slows down the wire coming out of the torch. With the tension set, I'm ready to run some wells on some pieces of aluminium scrap. Once again, it's bare wire, so the technique is to push the torch rather than drag it. I did no preparation on the metal surface and it's not too bad of a well bead first up. In part one I talked about using the spool gun for aluminium welding. This machine does not have the outlet for a spool gun but I think you can see with the right preparation it's more than capable of doing decent MIG welding of aluminium. I never set out to make this video about MIG welding techniques. There are plenty of teaching videos for MIG welding on YouTube. In none of the examples shown, have I cleaned the metal or set to fine tune the MIG weld. Rather, it's just to show you, the viewer, the capability of the Renegade Industrial 200 amp MIG machine that I ended up buying. Being new to me, I will spend some time getting the wire feed and voltage settings right for the welding I intend to do with this machine. And it's certainly turned out to be quite a versatile machine. I'm looking forward to using it on future work and projects. So, 
I hope you enjoyed that video and if you did I would welcome a thumbs up and by all means share it, share it widely. The White Dog Garage YouTube channel is about making stuff, fixing stuff, renovating stuff, maintaining stuff. And if you like that sort of thing and you haven't already subscribed, well think about subscribing. It's easily, just hit the subscribe bar down below. While you're there, ding the notification bell so that you will get a notification from YouTube the next time an episode airs on the White Dog Garage YouTube channel. I look forward to talking to you in another episode and thank you once again for watching. Bye.